Okay, thanks everyone for coming to my talk today. Uh, my name is Nathan Daly. I'm a software engineer at Relational AI. And uh, thanks for coming to our talk about incremental computation uh, with uh, this new framework, salsa.jl. So uh, I'm gonna start by explaining some use cases where um, uh, incremental computation and demand-driven computation actually show up in the world. And I'll explain what I mean by these words, incremental and on-demand. And um, then I'll cover why, um, why those are important, but why they're actually difficult to get right if you write uh, your code by hand, and so why you should be using a framework to build incremental programs. And then we'll introduce Salsa, which is our framework for doing just that, and cover a couple example programs written with Salsa. So to start off, um, I wanna talk about a, a killer Julia use case that I think maybe doesn't get a lot of attention, um, but is pretty amazing. Um, and that's uh, building your own language or, or a DSL uh, with Julia. So um, I think Julia makes it very tempting to, to write a language or a domain-specific language um, with its uh, very easy expression manipulation um, and uh, first-class runtime compilation. Um, so uh, like if you write a DSL, then your user's code in your, in your language is just as much normal Julia as like normal Julia. Uh, so you can write complex abstractions that, um, that, that have no runtime cost because uh, they boil down to just, just standard Julia code. So uh, imagine that you wanted to go about and build a language in Julia, how would you do it? So um, you're gonna need to start by writing a parser and maybe a compiler or an interpreter. Um, so uh, if, you're, if you're writing your DSL with macros, you need to write some macro code to transform the, the macros that the user writes into standard Julia. Um, or maybe you actually allow the user to write their program in a file and you need to be able to parse it from a string. Um, and then you wanna do some optimization. There are some transformations on the, on the expression tree that you, you've parsed and, and um, uh, optimize it in some way. Um, and ultimately you're gonna emit either like actually Julia code or maybe all the way down to LLVM. Um, so traditionally, the way people would write these kinds of compilers and parser programs is in uh, batch-oriented compilation. So um, you would read in the entire uh, user's program, and then you'd go through a bunch of passes. You'd parse the whole program, and then maybe you'd do type inference and constant propagation, and ultimately you convert all of that to a, uh, a binary or some executable code that you, that you ultimately run. Um, but uh, today, um, users really expect all of this to be interactive. So people are now running their code or they're writing their code in, in more interactive environments. And in these environments, maybe a batch mode compiler isn't the most ideal. Um, so what do I mean by interactive uh, programming? Um, there are you know, a lot of environments that people are using now while they're programming where they expect to be able to interact with the software they're writing as they write it. So um, maybe they're writing in an IDE, like Atom or VS Code, and they wanna get like mouse over tool Tip explanations about um, completions or, or the function signature of a function, or they wanna get highlighted syntax um, errors, things like that. Or maybe they're writing in a REPL and they wanna be able to enter some code and evaluate it and then change their mind about that code and enter different code and evaluate that. Uh, or they're in a notebook and they wanna actually intermix their results with their, with their code with, the, with um, explanatory text. And um, all of these are interactive, and actually in all of these, it's, it's, it's difficult to fundamentally get it right in every single case. So you'll often encounter situations in a notebook where you actually need to restart the notebook because it's gotten into some kind of state that it can't recover from, and, and, or, or you, you're in the REPL and you, you actually can't change this part of the, of the code in the REPL, and so you need to restart the whole thing. Or, or maybe it does all work, but it's just slow. Your, your ID doesn't keep up with your edits. Um, so to, to show an example of this, um, I wanna talk about the IDE case a little more. Um, this is a, from VS Code's uh, documentation page. And you can see like while you're typing, VS Code is doing a lot. Um, so here the user has a typo and they moused over it and it told them, well, you know, the name they wrote doesn't exist and so they know they can fix their typo. Or down here, as they're editing, VS Code is, is giving them uh, uh, suggestions, uh, completions based on the other code in their program. Like it's, uh, it's, it's telling them on this like property, what are all the provider, what are all the methods on this instance of their provider. Um, and then that shows the function signature on this update function. And so all of this is, is really extremely interactive. Um, and uh, not only is it responding to these little changes the user's typing and, and updating what it's displaying, but it is also uh, updating its, its background database of information about the program. So if somewhere else you added another method to this provider instance or whatever, 
Um, then when you come back here and you start typing, you would expect actually to see a new thing in your list of suggestions. You'd expect to see another entry here. And so um, you could imagine getting this interactivity to work by every time the user makes an edit anywhere, you throw away everything you've compiled and you recompile the whole program, the whole project with all of its different files and you regenerate that index of all of these information and then you reshow it to the user. But obviously that's gonna be too slow um, to work with, with at the rate that people are typing. And so um, what you want is that if the user's only edited a small part of the program, you only wanna have to recompile the code in that one small part of the program and you only wanna re-update your information about the, that one small part of the program. So um, you, want, you want your interactivity to be performant and, and reactive. So this idea is, is referred to as incremental computation. And that's this idea that if, if only a small part of the inputs to your process have changed, then you only wanna do a small amount of work to recompute your outputs. Um, put another way, the, the amount of time it takes to, to regenerate all of your outputs should be proportional to the size of the change to your inputs. Um, and so to achieve that, you basically want to be able to reuse those computations that you've, that you've computed um, that aren't affected by the change as much as possible. But you also want to be able to correctly recompute everything that was affected by the change. So uh, if you change only a small part, you want to be able to reuse the parts that aren't affected, but rerun the parts that are. And um, I want to show one more example about uh, of incremental computation in practice, uh, something we're all familiar with, and, and showed just like just how great it feels when this works. Um, so this is the standard Julia REPL, and you know you have a function here f which returns one, and um, you inline that function into another function g. When you call g, it also returns one. Um, but then later you change your mind and you realize actually wait a minute f was supposed to return two, not one, and so you rerun g, and now g returns two, which is like amazing. Uh, and so this is already an example of in, an interactive REPL um, that provides incremental uh, updates where you can, you can change a definition of a previous function and, and, it, and, it, and it gets updated. Um, but this didn't used to always be the case. Before this infamous Julia issue 265, which is one of the earliest, one of the earlier uh, Julia issues on GitHub, um, before this was fixed, which took a long time, uh, this didn't work. And, and now that it does, it's really marvelous, makes, makes Julia so much more fun to work with at the REPL. Um, but it doesn't work in every case. So if instead of making f a function, you had made f a constant, it gets inlined into g just the same. But when you change the definition of f, now it doesn't update the definition of g. And uh, the reason for this is because the update mechanism that, that Julia uses to allow you to change the definition of f was written by hand specific to functions. There's a, there's a, a place in functions where you keep track of what other functions they've inlined but that doesn't have a place to keep track of, of constants. And there's no reason fundamentally it couldn't, it's just that it was like hard to get it right. Like the, it would have been a lot of rewriting to get this to work, a lot of refactoring because constants like aren't represented in memory the same way as, as, as functions. And so it was just deemed that this is not important enough to like put a lot of time into rewriting. And so the, the main uh, thing I wanna get across here is that um, <clears throat> incremental performance is really amazing when it works, but it's difficult to get it right in every case if you write it by hand. Here's another one you might be more familiar with. You're happily writing your program in Julia in a source file. You're using revise, you edit your functions and they just update, but suddenly you change the definition of a struct and revise just gives up. Um, so it doesn't need to be this way. Um, and uh, if, if you are writing your own program and you wanna have incremental behavior, um, instead of trying to write it by hand and, and try to get all these corner cases right, um, you should go get yourself an incremental computation framework so that you can rely on it being right. And that's why we've uh, uh, built Salsa. So the, the, the core idea in this talk is that using a framework to automatically provide incrementality allows you to, to have guaranteed correct invalidation and recomputation in the programs that you're writing. And if we build this framework correctly, we can get that guarantee with almost no overhead. So by getting these fundamentals right, the, the, the core nugget of, of um, reuse and invalidation, then we can rely on that and, and build a whole program uh, and, and just automatically get this interactive, uh, correct invalidation, uh, fast behavior. So this is our framework for doing just that. It's called Salsa. Um, it's a framework for building incremental demand-driven software. And it comes from, um, it's, it's very heavily inspired by the open source Rust package, uh, Salsa RS, um, which came from the Rust compiler team at Mozilla, rewriting the entire Rust compiler actually with the specific focus of making the IDE experience work better. Um, it was too slow and so they wanted to rewrite it to be incremental from the, from the ground up. 
And so they gave it a shot and they ended up giving up and starting over because it was too hard. And the second, the third time around, they, they wrote a framework first and then they built the, the reactive compiler on top of the framework. And so um, I'd really highly recommend you watch this talk, Responsive Compilers by Nicholas Matsakis, um, who talks about this exact uh, project and this also framework that came out of it. And it was really inspiring for us and it's a little bit longer than the time I have today. So uh, it gives you a lot more information if you're interested. So to get all of this working, Salsa really provides two main features. Um, and, and these are the features on top of which uh, the incrementality guarantees come from. Um, so the main feature is memoization. And uh, this is just like existing memoization frameworks you might have seen out there, like memoization.jl or memoize.jl, which I know have had Julia Khan talks in the past. Um, and this is the ability to say, when you run a function, we cache the results of that function. And the next time you call that function with the same arguments, we just give you the cache value. But unlike, unlike memoize.jl, the other thing that it does is this runtime dependency tracking, where um, we keep track of all the other dependencies, the other dependent functions that you call, uh, the other computations that you invoke while computing your result. And if any of those other computations change, then we know that we can invalidate the result that you had cached and uh, run it again. So um, we give you both caching of your results and cache invalidation when those results are no longer the most up-to-date result. Um, and so uh, you might have heard this like software uh, uh, computer science adage that um, there's really only two hard things in computer science. Uh, naming things and cache invalidation. So um, uh, if you build your system with Salsa, uh, then the only thing you have left to figure out that's hard is what to name it. Because uh, we'll, we'll handle the cache invalidation for you. Um, so uh, this is what it looks like in practice. Um, there's uh, uh, just these two macros in Salsa. Um, you start by declaring your inputs to your program, which are um, like your givens. Uh, or your external state that, you're, that um, your program depends on. So if, for example, you're building a compiler, then your external state is like the source code that the user has, has written, the user's source code. Or if um, you're writing a machine learning program, the inputs are like your data, so your, um, things like that. And then you write some function which uh, computes a result um, from those inputs. It, it transforms those inputs to produce a result. But um, you mark some of those functions as derived functions. And a derived function is one where Salsa will um, run the function just like normal, but it will cache the results of that function. And then um, while it's running it, it will track any other inputs. For example, this f calls a. Um, it'll track any other Salsa dependencies. And if any of those dependencies change, then we know we need to rerun f the next time you ask for it. So that's, that's really it. This is what it looks like in practice. Um, you create a new Salsa runtime, which is the, the state object that holds all of your Salsa state and your caches. And so then um, if you have this input A, you set a value for A and A is an integer. So we say A is gonna be one. And then we run F and you can see the first time it runs F, it prints running F, but the second time it doesn't because um, the result has been memoized. So it runs A plus one, gives you two and, and remembers that result the next time. But then if you actually go and you change A, you set a different value for A, then the next time you ask for f again, it's no longer valid and you'll have to rerun f. So that is Salsa in practice. So I also wanted to talk real quick, uh, a little bit deeper of an example. Um, this is a, um, an example of what this runtime dependency graph might actually look like. It's, it's, uh, I've, I've left out some parts of the tree, like on the left-hand side, just to kind of show you what this looks like. But um, Imagine that the user is here in an IDE like VS Code and, and we wrote a, a language plugin for, for this language in VS Code that will um, give you suggestions. And so um, the user's cursor is right here after this comma and um, they, the, the, the framework might ask, um, the plugin might ask the program, uh, what is the tooltip that I should display right now? And so um, it'll check and say, well, maybe I wanna display a function signature if the user's halfway through writing a function call. And so we say, hey, are we partway through writing a function call at line 65 in column 22? And we see that, yes, actually we are. We're, we're halfway through writing foo and we haven't finished it yet. So this function will return foo and then we'll call another derived function and say, okay, well, I wanna display the signature for foo, what is that? And this derived function uh, computes the signature for foo. And to get that, we have to actually go and look at the entire definition for foo to, to you know, read out just the signature. And to get that, ultimately we have to go all the way back to the source text that the user wrote um, in, in their file. And so um, this dependency tree is, is, dependency graph is built up dynamically at runtime. 
um, based on the user's data. Like if they had written a different name here, the graph would look different. You'd be asking for a different um, signature. And so um, once you have this dependency graph, then you could take advantage of this to reduce the amount of work you have to do on future changes. So if somebody changes the text in some other function, baz, then we know that none of this graph is affected and we don't need to rerun any of this, um, any of this computation. Or if they change the definition, but they don't change the signature, we still don't need to regenerate the tool type. We can reuse the existing tool type. So that's the idea behind Salsa. Um, and, and now I just want to take the remaining time to talk through some examples of, of using Salsa in practice. So one really nice example uh, program that, that is inter in interactive and incremental is um, actually just standard spreadsheets like Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets. And these are um, demand-driven programs because uh, uh, the user is able to make a change somewhere and um, the spreadsheet program will only recompute the values that are affected by that change. So in this example, um, the user maybe starts by writing, um, I'll wait for it to start again, sorry, here. So the user writes two plus two over here in this cell and the formula is, is evaluated and we compute that actually that's four. Um, and then they write another formula in cell A uh, that actually references this other value. It says it's gonna be 10 plus B. And so we know now there's a dependency from B1 to A1. And so if we change the value of B, it changes the value of A. And that reset too fast, but I have a screenshot of it over here, uh, where basically while we evaluated A, we saw that this depended on B, and so we record this dependency. And then we know that any subsequent change to B means we have to also recompute A. But if you had changed some other cell, like C or D, um, A and B would not be affected. So this is the behavior we need, and you can see how, again, it needs to be this runtime dependency, because if A had been different text, it might depend on a different cell. Um, and so it, it's kind of a cool example where the dependencies between the computations in your program are actually derived from your data. And, uh, and, and so that's why it's really important that this dependency tracking happens um, at runtime. So, okay, I wanna uh, walk through a, a building that exact program that'll do this behavior um, uh, with Salsa in just like 30 lines. Um, and um, this is up here, this is the entire program. Um, it's, it's really quite straightforward. Uh, and we're gonna just walk through it line, uh, uh, section by section to give you a sense of what it's doing. Um, so um, you start by using Salsa and creating an input. So like we said before, this is, um, this is your, your view to the outside world, it's, it's your external state. And so in this case, this is gonna be, um, what is the text string that a user has set for a given cell ID, like B or A, like we saw before. Um, so that's our input. And then um, we also have a derived function uh, value, which says for any given cell, not only what is its text, but how can we transform that text and actually produce the value to display. And so we basically just say, well, just do whatever the text was, except for if it starts with an equal sign, then we're actually just gonna evaluate it like a Julia expression. So, so that's it. And um, so this is how it works in practice. You create, like I said before, you create a runtime, which is your salsa um, state that keeps all of your your caches and things like that. Um, and then you just start setting some text. So uh, we'll say that the user has a cell A and inside this cell we put hi. And then um, if we ask for the contents of that cell, we can see that it's A. Um, but the, the more interesting thing is actually if we can set a, a whole Julia expression in here, like two plus two, like just like we did in that demo. And now if we get the text, we see that, yeah, the user entered two plus two and the value of this cell is, um, is gonna be four. So we walked through this value function, we saw that it started with an equals, and we, we evaluated this, this code on the right-hand side. Um, and if we evaluate it again, we're actually just gonna get, we're not, we're not gonna rerun the function, we're gonna reuse the previous existing value. Um, it's a, it, it'll be easier to see that actually if we make that uh, have some, some, some interesting side effects. So let's actually make the contents of this function be a little, uh, a whole little program here that um, actually like prints out hello, and then returns a new value. So let's do like one plus one. And so uh, now the contents of the A cell are like a whole little Julia program. And um, if we get the value of that cell, you can see the first time it runs, it actually executes the high statement and then returns the value, but the second time it doesn't. So this is like a standard caching of the value. Um, but as we just saw before, if you change the input, the value is updated. And the last thing to make this like actually a spreadsheet is that we need to be able to refer to other cells 
in order to, um, and if we see that a cell refers to another cell, we want to replace that reference with the value from that cell. So um, I'm going to use a slightly updated version of the value function. And this one, right before it evaluates the expression, it calls this substitute references function, which does a really quick walk of the expression tree and then um, finds any time where the, where, where, the, uh, where the expression looks like a cell name and it replaces it with the cell's value. So uh, now we can see that if we set, let's make a new cell, we'll call it B, and we'll set this one to be A plus one. Then um, if we get the value of B, oops, if we get the value of B, then we'll see it was two plus three, because remember the value of A was two. And um, now we can actually go and we can set the value of A to be something else, like 100. And if we ask for the value of B, uh, it's up to you. So, so that's it. That's our little spreadsheet program. Uh, didn't take very long to write. And, um, and, and you have automatic recompilation, uh, recomputation and invalidation from Salsa. So um, kind of the, the, the neat thing there is we didn't write any invalidation code. We just wrote sort of normal Julia code um, where we said, you know, start from some input and transform it to some output. But Salsa actually discovered this dependency graph that you see here at runtime. When we, when we ran the function to compute the value for A, um, we, we also had to run the function to compute the value for B. And these are the inputs they depend on. And so we can use this to automatically redo um, uh, uh, invalidation. So that is that. Um, there's a more complete spreadsheet example here in the Salsa repo, which you can access online. And this one has like a, a more proper UI and it has full um, parallelism. So every cell is computed in parallel. And um, if there's cells that depend on each other, they'll, um, they'll wait for each other, things like that. So, um, and it has error handling and, and much more. So you can go check that out there. And the last thing uh, that I wanted to talk about is um, so far we've really been focused on this kind of compiler or programming language angle of uh, incremental computation, but actually reactive programming or incremental programming shows up in a lot more contexts um, besides. It's, it's not just a compiler thing, um, but, but like I had said before, this is, it, it, it's, it's difficult to get this right. And so if we have a framework for this and it's easy to build incremental programs, um, I imagine there will be maybe even more uh, use cases for incrementality that, that start to show up. Um, so just a few here uh, that you might be familiar with already are um, these reactive web programs that are, that are coming out where you can make a change to your input and, and just everything on the website updates immediately. Or people are working on reactive notebooks that solve the, the problem I mentioned earlier where the notebook gets into a bad state. Um, in a reactive notebook, anytime you change anything anywhere, the whole, pro the whole notebook immediately updates so that um, there, there is no like hidden state. And um, uh, there's actually this project Pluto.jl to, to build reactive notebooks in Julia that's going on right now. And um, yeah, and there's more here on this slide. And I wanna just call out, um, this is the space that relational AI uh, kind of fits in in this slide. Um, we're building a, a, a reactive database that um, will, will allow you to build complete reactive uh, applications on the web or otherwise. So a little more about what we're doing. I know I, I hadn't given you any context uh, at the beginning of the talk, but um, so uh, the, the important thing from this presentation's perspective is that at Relational AI, we're using Salsa for everything we've talked about here today. Um, we're doing all of these things. Uh, so we're building this entire knowledge graph management system, which is quite a, a, a large um, system, uh, and it's built entirely around Salsa. Um, we have a demand-driven compiler and a demand-driven database. Um, that take advantage of the abilities this also gives us to do some really state-of-the-art things like um, separate compilation and, and live programming where you can actually, um, you can write a program that has errors, but you can still execute other parts of the program uh, uh, that don't have, have any errors. We have multi-stage programming, um, but we don't just have these cool compiler things. Unlike most other people who do think about incremental computation, we've actually got this throughout our whole system because we built everything on top of Salsa. So, um, so you can actually ask for a, a query from our database and, and its result will be cached and uh, remembered unless any inputs change, then, then we'll know how to recompute it. And many more of the features here you see were all uh, built on top of Salsa. And as a result, we have this state-of-the-art um, declarative programming language, declarative uh, uh, state-of-the-art um, demand-driven database and relational machine learning engine um, all falling out of this uh, feature. So, that's that. Um, we'd love for you to come join us. The Salsa package is open source and available on GitHub. 
Um, we're, like I said, we're using it in production to serve clients, so we think it's reasonably robust, and we'd love to have you start um, using it in your own projects and contributing to the development um, of the package. So thanks so much for your time and your attention.